This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for watching this week's NC Spin. We begin this week's show by talking about a report listing North Carolina as having the seventh best economic outlook in the nation. That dovetails into a discussion about a moral economy and illicit relationships. We'll highlight six legislative proposals to improve our students' mental health, and of course we'll ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Speaking of our panel of experts, they include former House Speaker and seems like worldwide traveler, Joe Mavretti, Chris Fitzsimon, political analyst, John Hood, syndicated columnist and author, and Cash Michael, statewide journalist and filmmaker. We're going to begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages by our underwriters. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end-of-life decisions, your family physician is with you every step for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Agriculture. It's North Carolina's number one economic driver. It puts people to work. It powers our economy. And as agriculture grows, so does our quality of life. North Carolina Farm Bureau is proud to support agriculture and our farmers because agriculture connects us all. Let's get to it. There's evidence that North Carolina's economy slowed a bit in 2017, but that wasn't enough of a factor to prevent a, a report titled Rich States, Poor States from saying our state had the seventh best economic outlook among the 50 states. Question one to Chris Fitzsimon. This report was sponsored by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. They claim to be a nonpartisan organization. However, many progressives say they have a decided conservative tilt to their recommendations. Does that color or diminish in any way their recommendations? Well, I think uh, it does color them some, and I don't think it's just progressives that say that. I mean, ALEC is uh, a very Republican-aligned organization. You, you could, they could claim they're nonpartisan. They're definitely an ideological organization. One of the authors of the report is Arthur Laffer, famous for the Laffer Curve and supply-side economics, that actually believes if you cut taxes, you'll increase revenue. We haven't seen that on the federal level where tax cuts have led to big deficits. So I do think there's some credibility issues. On the other hand of the report, on the other hand, I do think North Carolina could be positioned uh, to do well in the economy. I th I'm worried that at what Alec is doing is seeing tax cuts that they like and saying that means North Carolina is going to do well. I think we have some challenges. I think we have some things in our favor. We have big infrastructure needs and a lot of other things. So I wouldn't jump to any conclusions. Well, uh, Chris makes a good point. Uh, Jason Sane, who's a Republican from Lincoln County, is, is the national chairman of Alec this year. Uh, they list factors like the, the fact that we're a right-to-work state, we don't have an inheritance tax, um, but they put the big emphasis in making this forecast on the tax cuts our legislature has made um, in recent years. Uh, personal income tax from five and a half to four and a quarter, uh, corporate taxes from three to two and a half. Uh, Joe, they say these are pro-growth tax cuts. Does the performance we've had since that time indicate we are pro-growth? <laughs> I think it's laughable. Uh, of the 15 measurements, 10 of them have to do with taxes. Uh, one of the more foolish ones has to do with the cost for workers comp uh, unemployed workers' compensation. Uh, this, is the, this is a game that's been played nationwide and it's been played for a long time, Tom. What you do is you decide what answers you want, you set up your system and you get those <laughs> answers, then you go out and say it's wonderful. All right. Well, John, last week you reported on uh, Tell Us Something We Don't Know that we, the state had a budget surplus uh, so far for the first three quarters of the year of more than $300 million. Uh, you think we can attribute that budget surplus to tax cuts or to spending cuts or to economic growth well, or we have all a, of the above? We have a revenue surplus of $300 million okay, and I a budget it. surplus yeah. of $600 million. Okay. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that the 
tax cuts are this is not a Laffer curve effect. Okay, when you get when, when you're at the state level and you reduce income taxes, that's good for the economy. And the Alec report is absolutely right about that. They have the best evidence for that. But that doesn't mean it's going to generate more money than you would have received if you hadn't cut the income taxes. That's that's never going to happen at the state level. Certainly not in the short run. And that's not the reason. The reason is we have a pretty good economy. In fact, compared to most states, a very good economy. Uh, some of that is because we have a right to work because we have low workers' comp and unemployment insurance costs. All those things but, but Mike have been Walden proven this to help. Uh, uh, publishes the economic indicators from North Carolina State University, and he said we dropped 1.7 percent from February to March of this year. The only improvement was uh, unemployment claims. Uh, Cash, what does that tell you about our economy? Well, you know. It, it, Normally, and, and, and I know Dr. Walden uh, uh, well, I'm sure everybody at the table does, normally you want to see a pattern of more than just one, one month. Uh, once you see a pattern, then that gives you some definitive information as to what direction you're going and then what you should do to plan for what, what that direction tells you is coming. So I, I'd like to see more than just one month. Chris, we've got some, we, we're talking about this, this uh, surplus of funds uh, over projections. We got some pretty big needs staring us in the face. Mm -hmm. The legislature comes back into session May 18th. Um, we've got to talk about prison safety, school safety, employee pay raises, Principal which base. which which are right. obviously going to take place because this is an election year. Right. Um, are, are you are we ready for this? Do we have any idea how this surplus might be appropriated? No, and I think that'll be the big battle. And remember, a surplus means it's a one-time surplus, and the money that they use for all these continuing expenses are based on what they believe the growth in the economy is going to be and how much money that's going to bring in. I do think it's important to point out for viewers, though, when we say we have a budget surplus, all that means is that they were relatively accurate or even cautious in how much they forecasted. That yeah. doesn't mean we made the right spending decisions or not, or cut taxes too much or not. It means that they were relatively accurate in their forecast. Uh, Joe, uh, John wrote a column this past week uh, which said he didn't expect the legislature to blow the surplus, the rainy day money that we've put aside, which is about a billion eight right. in the rainy day fund and about $500 million in, in other reserves. Um, would you agree with that? Yes, I think John's absolutely right on, on rainy day fund. Uh, I think you need a shock absorber. Uh, good Lord, if you want to look at the worst case scenario, look at the federal government uh, and it, it, compared to North Carolina. Uh, a five to six percent shock fund is a very good thing to have. So Cash, uh, given all of this discussion, you think Alex's uh, <coughs> forecast for economic growth, ranking us seventh in the nation um, for positive economic growth, you think it was accurate? I've seen the report, and I hear the Republican leadership. Let's see. <laughs> All right. A positive let's see. Um, it's, uh, okay, I got, I'll write that down. Well, speaking of the economy, Duke Chapel in Durham was the scene of a presentation by former presidential candidate Bernie Sanders and Bishop William Barber, the former head of the state NAACP, <coughs> They spoke on the topic of a moral economy, and I want us to discuss that subject. But one comment Bishop Barber made that has really resonated with me and I've thought about, he said that every night on the cable channels and even on the main networks, all we seem to be talking about is Stormy Daniels or some other suggested illicit relationships. Barber said the most pornographic thing that has happened in America is the re illicit relationship between the Supreme Court and big business the relationship that produced Citizen United. Cash, do you agree that Citizens United was an illicit relationship? <laughs> well, Reverend, Reverend Barber certainly uh, uh, has pushed that point. It, it, you know, when you, Citizens United clearly is probably the most controversial, one of the most controversial uh, uh, decisions handed down by the court in, in recent years. And, and I'm pretty sure John is going to disagree with me, and I, and I await your... Oh, uh, I agree. It was controversial. <laughs> it shouldn't have been. Well, I haven't have finished what I was about to say, though. <laughs> um, you know, when, when we say, or when the court says, excuse me, that um, giving ob obscene, this is where the pornography comes in, obscene amounts of money uh, 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 to uh, promote candidates um, is free speech and thus should be allowed, and that's versus what free speech is supposed to be about, which is giving the individual a chance to, to speak and be heard as it relates to the issues, 
um, many people consider that to be obscene, that, that business, that a corporation now has the same rights as, as an American individual. All right, John, you get equal time on this because I know that <laughs> well, there's... Well, it's very simple. This was a censorship case. It was an attempt by the federal government to censor a movie and to say it couldn't be shown. It should have been a 9-0 to zero decision in favor of the uh, Citizens United, an organization that wanted to pr promote a movie and show a movie, and the federal government said you can't do it. it. Had nothing to do with campaign contributions. It had nothing to do with any of that. It was a censorship case, and it was outrageous. Well, Joe, that those four justices didn't agree. It certainly has has branched from that into unlimited. Yeah, John, <clears throat> you know, I, let's go back a bit. Uh, if you have the right to vote, then I think you have the right to contribute. If you ah. do not have the right to vote, then I don't think you can contribute. So, so corporations don't have the right I, to vote. If you have the right to vote, you should be able to contribute, and it should be reported. Here's, I, well, here's the thing. I think, first of all, I, obviously, I disagree with John. This decision that's interpreted to allow corporations to spend hundreds of millions of dollars influence campaigns, we, we're going to disagree about that. Here's the hypocrisy of the whole thing. We held on this show 15 years ago came to an agreement that we're going to disagree about what the problem is, but we know one of the solutions is transparency and sunshine. Mm -hmm. The court also said, has said, and has held many times, it is completely within the rights of Congress and state legislatures to pass laws to make public where all those dollars are coming from. The Republicans have controlled Congress since this decision. They've claimed they were for transparency. They haven't done one thing. So one of the biggest problems, not the amount, which is a problem, is that we have no idea in the world who's paying for every ad against any candidate. And this is on both sides. It's outrageous that voters don't have the information. That is within the power of our legislative bodies. And they refuse, hip hypocritically, I think, on the right, to pass meaningful transparency legislation to at least tell us where this money's coming 15 from. Fifteen years ago, you and I had hair. That's true. <laughs> and so did cash, for that matter. That's transparent the, now, though. Yeah, that's very transparent. <laughs> uh, Joe Bernie Sanders said, a moral economy is one that says, mm -hmm. in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, all our people should be able to live with dignity and security. First of all, do you uh, agree with that definition? And secondly, how would you define dignity and security? First of all, it's practically impossible. I'm a student of Native American culture. It was impossible then. That's why they had the great giveaways. It's impossible now. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, great mansions in Newport, Rhode Island without great disparity. There's no such thing as not having great disparity in a market economy. So. They need to get, you know, get but, used but to that, it. But does that say that all, everybody else should not be able to live with dignity and security? Well, here again, nice words, nice inflammatory words, but practically in a market economy, not possible. All right, let, let's go a little deeper with this, John. Um, would you say that compared to 50 years ago, you were just a pup at the time, 50 years ago, <laughs> America is more moral about the same, so far as morality is concerned, or has lower morals than we had 50 years ago? Um, it depends on which category of morals we're talking about. Uh, in many I've got ways, a broad moral basket. Well, in, in many ways, there's, it's unambiguously true that America today is better off, not just materially, but in terms of how people treat each other, there's a variety of positives. You the think, negatives, of course. You think we're better off the way we treat each other? Absolutely. There's absolutely no okay. question about right. that. However, What's your evidence? Uh, we have civil rights laws. We have a variety of things that have improved people's behavior towards Women's each rights other. Laws, yeah. but, and our crime rates are lower. There's a lot of things that are positive, but the negatives involve family and the care, the the, the uh, caring of, of young children. That er in that area, in some ways, we've gone backwards. I, don't, I want to challenge a little bit of what just said. I don't think it's inflammatory to say we need security and dignity. Those don't strike me as inflammatory terms. And the idea in the market economy is not we're not talking about the ceiling. We're talking about the floor. I think other countries in Western Europe, they don't they're not perfect, but they have seemed to figure out a way to have some reasonable floor. I think that's what Bernie Sanders was talking about. I don't agree with everything he says, but I do think he was on the right track. Tom, I think one of the things we ought to remember is who the <laughs> spokesmen are. You know, uh, William Barber can take two eggs, some goose feathers, and some wood chips and make an omelet, and a lot of people believe him. Okay. All right. Well, moving on from 
that kind of omelet. Sounds omelet. like a good meal. It's a wood yes. chip omelet. <laughs> yes. you know, it's With a goose feathers. Omelet. That's, that's the, that, okay. Well, the Legislative <laughs> School Safety <laughs> Subcommittee on Student Health released their report on what our state could do to have safer schools. We talked last week about Governor Cooper's request for an additional $130 million to make schools safer. So we were interested in hearing the legislature's recommendations. They had six recommendations ranging from increasing the number of school nurses, social workers, and school psychologists to establishing a threat assessment team in every school that would spot threatening behaviors that could lead to violence. Joe, if we brought the numbers of nurses, social workers, and psychologists to the recommended ratios, it would cost more than $380 million per year. You served in the legislature for many years. Is that going to happen? I hope not. Now, this is one of these knee-jerk reactions because we've had public school shootings around the country that every governor and every general assembly wants to do something about it top down. These kinds of problems are best served from the bottom up. We have 115 school boards, local school uh, uh, agencies, yeah. and so what we ought to do, if we have this kind of money available, then we ought to have that money unrestricted to go to them and let them decide for themselves locally how best to handle those Chris, issues. Chris, this whole discussion uh, sort of triggered in me some thoughts. Uh, whether we're looking at school safety as being an internal problem or an external problem. Uh, in other words, is the larger worry one of having, uh, uh, worrying about students uh, harming other students, or is it one of having outsiders come into school and creating Well, we've violence. had both. We've but, had students, well, we've former had both, students. That's right. I think the worry is both. But I, And I don't think it's a, a, a ridiculous for the legislature to recommend that we need and to provide increased funding for school counselors and school nurses. There are professionals that do that. I think the, the threat assessment team, I think, is a little more complicated, and I worry about where maybe some of that is going. Uh, but I think this is a good start for the debate for the short session. I hope we have it. John, we can remember not too many years ago, we were, we were debating whether or not schools should have art teachers and music teachers and PE instructors and so forth. Now we're saying the schools can't operate without nurses, counselors, and psychologists. What caused this change? Well, there's a lot of talk right now about school safety. Uh, of course, in the long, uh, over the long period of time, we were just talking earlier about decades-long trends. We're safer today than we were in the past. However, um, what I find useful about this is we really are targeting questions about mental health. We should be focusing on how to detect the kinds of shooters who have shot up schools, which is a narrow, focused approach rather than a blunderbuss approach. No, no pun intended. Cash, uh, Governor Cooper's Crime Commission is, is due to report uh, out to us. They're having a meet, uh, meeting uh, next week, I think. Uh, he's previously recommended $130 million for school safety. Um, uh, per year. Um, we haven't heard a lot of support coming from the media or anyone else over these recommendations. You think this is going to turn into another match between the governor and the legislature in the short session? Well, again, you, you know, you said the magic words earlier that this is an election year. So depending on, on, depending on if something happens here in North Carolina, that's not something that has happened yet. We have not had an incident that has garnered national attention. Um, and if we do, then I think that'll add fuel to that fire. But let me just very, very quickly say one thing. It's more than just school shooters. We have a, a, a number of young people attending our public schools across the state that come from broken homes. And they bring those, 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 those uh, problems with them to the classroom. And the teachers... They've had their teacher's assistance taken away from them. They have, it's just them. And they've got larger classrooms, so now they can't handle these kids and teach at the same Tom, time. Joe, you get last word yeah, on this. Tom, You've got a son that's a principal. Well, Tom, let, let, let me say it. Think of all the money and time we spent with the nuclear appar uh, preparedness in the schools across America in the 50s. Yeah, I hid under a desk many exactly. times. Exactly. And what, and what did you get for it? Nothing. Uh, very little, no, no uh, which <laughs> leads us into our next topic. On October 8th of 2016, our state was hit by Hurricane Matthew. Many are asking why it's taking so long to get relief to those hardest hit by this storm. Former Governor Pat McCrory says we have a leadership void that's responsible. Administration officials say McCrory is trying to play politics with the subject, and part of the delay is because... In December of 2016, the legislature transferred the recovery operations from the Department of Commerce, 
why they were there, nobody understands, to emergency management. Even so, they say $500 million has been spent on recovery. John, let's see if we can eliminate the heated political rhetoric and talk about recovery efforts. What's your assessment about how fast or slow Matthew recovery has occurred and who might be to blame for its lack of progress? Well, I think that the governor uh, has made two appropriate points. One of them, there was a change in agency. Number two, a lot of other money in other categories has been spent. The problem Governor Cooper has is that other states that are in a similar boat than we have have spent those dollars more quickly than North Carolina has. That's the problem he's got, and it's particularly fatuous for him to complain that former Governor McCrory is politicizing the emergency and the recovery from hurricanes. I remember what happened in the campaign of 2016. Both sides politicized pretty much everything. I, I, I got that, but uh, Chris, we've been hanging around here politics for a while. Have you ever heard a former <laughs> governor go after a sitting governor like no, that? No, but I mean, Governor McCrory is still bitter, I think, clearly. I mean, every, when he's quoted often, I think that's one of the things he talks about. I don't think he's quite come to grips yet with the fact that he didn't win re-election. Re John is right. Governor Cooper has spent some of the money. Uh, it's true that they, they shifted it to emergency management from commerce, whether it should have been there or not. But the other point is, for years, North Carolina had something called the North Carolina Community Development Corporation that had people on the ground who were prepared, who knew what was happening in their communities, who could deliver the money. This is going to sound facetious, I don't mean it, but if I get walked up to you and said, here's $50 million, go out and spend it on affordable housing tomorrow in Raleigh, what would you do? Who would you give it to? How would you know? Where's the, where's the network to do that? How do you build those houses? Who's going to do it? That's, that's the issue. And I don't, I'm not disagreeing that Cooper's been a little slow, but to completely blame him for this, I think, is off base. Joe, there was an editorial in the Virginian Pilot, which is a, a newspaper you're familiar with up in the uh, Tidewater area, that said South Carolina received about the same type and amount of monies that we did, but the efforts there are far ahead of ours in North Carolina. And they said that in the absence of any other explanation, they just think this is a lack of competence on our part. I think the, the Virginian pilot is on to it. We uh, pride ourselves in comparing ourselves with, with Virginia and with South Carolina in almost every category, almost every day. And so this time we shot ourselves in the foot and we ought to take the blame for it. Cash, finally, I want, uh, former Governor McCrory offered to assemble a group of former governors to come down here and, and help uh, Governor Ed, uh, Cooper on hurricane relief. Is this just a political ploy or could these governors actually help? They have, most of them have lived through storms and disasters. Look at my face. <laughs> I saw that face. <laughs> That's that face, your answer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I hope that, I hope that Governor, Governor McCrory is watching my face. <laughs> okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, it's the it's best not going. Listen, this is too sticky. We got former governors who wouldn't want to get in this briar patch. Yeah, I got that <laughs> right. So can we expect now, after all of this, some speed up in the disaster recovery, John? Yes, because this has given Governor Cooper a black eye, and he knows it. It okay. really has hurt him. You think it has? Well, I think it, uh, sure. I think the, the, the Republicans have mounted an effective political campaign. He has made some mistakes. It's a combination. He, should, he needs to respond. All right. Let's pivot ourselves uh, to the discussion that uh, so many of you say you like, and that's when we ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Joe Mavretic, I'll start with you. Uh, last August, uh, uh, show 981, I think. Uh, but who's counting? I said that uh, <laughs> the United States is turning from a patriarchy to a matriarchy. Uh, I thought that maybe the Clinton, uh, if Clinton won, it would be accelerated. The truth is an unintended consequence of the Trump victory is that instead of getting there by 2050, I think now we'll get there by 2040, 2045. Okay. So we're narrowing this prognostication. Well, it's, it's accelerating, and we're going to be a matriarchy before the, the middle of the century. So uh, Thomasina uh, Campbell is going to be <laughs> moderating this show soon. Is that well, what you No, what's going to happen is there are going to be changes in priorities in the political arenas. Okay. Chris Fitzsimon, tell us something we don't know. Well, don't blink, because the state budget will be, is being put together as we sit here already. Uh, there's a lot of word inside Raleigh that uh, appropriation subcommittee chairs are talking. That they're talking to the leadership in the House and the Senate. Their goal to get out, by the, the, have a budget passed by early to mid-June, thinking Governor Cooper is going to veto it. We would all think in, in some ways, oh, that's good news, they won't be around. The problem is, that means the budget's going to be written by a handful of folks. We just mentioned all the needs that are so happening in new? North Carolina. Well, what the, right, and that's the point. What's new? we got to stop tolerating. We need this secret budget process. We need a big input about these child uh, school safety measures and a lot of other things, pay raises. I still am hoping in my lifetime for an open budget process again. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. 
You're saying that pie's already been uh, cooked. It's pretty close. Yeah. John, tell us something we don't know. <clears throat> well, uh, first I'd say that the open budget process is more possible in an odd-numbered year. If you're going to start a session in May and try to get by the end of the fiscal year, you're, you're going to have trouble. Now. Anyway, l downtowns in North Carolina have been growing rapidly, <laughs> and we've all been hearing a lot about that. But I just want people to understand, to keep it in perspective. Twenty years ago in Raleigh, there were fewer than 2,000 people living downtown. Now there's about 8,500. That's a dramatic growth, and it's less than 2 percent of Raleigh's population. It's less than 1 percent of Wake County's population. Let's keep things in perspective. It's interesting, but it is not monumental. Cash Michaels, tell us something we don't know. On Sunday, May 13th, Mother's Day, uh, Reverend Dr. William Barber, a gentleman who de deserves considerable respect, in my opinion, uh, will be kicking off the National Poor People's Campaign. And it will be uh, 40 days uh, nationally of putting the emphasis on issues that affect of poor people in this country. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Give your feedback and read my weekly column. Be sure to visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook and join us next week. We're going to look at the uh, May primaries and have more balanced debate for the Old North State. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end of life decisions, your family physician is with you every step, for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Agriculture. It's North Carolina's number one economic driver. It puts people to work. It powers our economy. And as agriculture grows, so does our quality of life. North Carolina Farm Bureau is proud to support agriculture and our farmers because agriculture connects us all. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.